everyone. I'm Steve. We're at Number 12 Cider in Minneapolis. And I'm Colin from Number 12 Cider. So he and I have been buddies for a long time, like uh, more than most people have been alive. And uh, we've been making cider for a long time too, about 25 years. We have a cider production facility here in Minneapolis. We're standing in it. And uh, so we're going to offer a little series of uh, YouTube videos on how to make cider. So maybe Colin, uh, as far as the, the most basic part of it, what does it take to make cider? Well, to make cider, it's as simple as apple juice and yeast. If you have those two things, you can make good cider. But we're going to show you how to do that today. Really? That's all there is to it, huh? Very cool. Very cool. So uh, because you told me that before we started this, I went out and bought some apple juice from the grocery store. So and what kind of apple juice are you looking for there? Does it matter? Well, you know, of course it matters, right? Of course it matters, but uh, this is not about that. We're going to do another video on the different kinds of apples and, and juices uh, and what, what's good for cider and what's not good for cider. But you can, make, you can make cider out of this, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I look at the ingredients list here and I see apple juice, filtered water, and malic acid. And those are all good fermentation elements. Well, is there something in here that if I had bought it at the store would be not good for making cider? Well, if you, you don't want other chemicals, so we don't want things like sulfites or sorbates or other things listed. That would be something that might kill the yeast. So we're looking for just a basic apple juice or an apple juice concentrate, something like that. Okay, okay, good. Well, here's another question for you, Colin. I bought some of these. What do you think about that? That works great. We can, we can have some fun with that. All right, this is 100% uh, juice, apple concentrate. Would this make a different kind of cider than this? Uh, yeah, it'd be a higher alcohol cider because that concentrate has more sugar than a regular juice. So that's gonna be a nice high alcohol, nice kick. Uh, okay, wait a minute. More sugar means higher alcohol? Uh, how does that work? Well, that's what the yeast does which is going to be later. We're going to pitch some yeast in our juice. That process is going to turn that sugar in the, in the apple juice into alcohol. So the more sugar you start with, the more alcohol you have at the end. Okay, so there's more sugar in this, but it says that I should mix it with three cans of water. And you can do that too. If you want to reconstitute it back to its original form of just apple juice, you'll get a regular cider at a regular okay. alcohol level. If you want to actually ferment that as concentrate, you can do that too. Okay, all right. So uh, I, at your instruction, cleaned some uh, equipment here today. Looks good. So that we can uh, get this process started. And uh, uh, I mean, what do you need as far as a container to, to ferment this apple juice? You know, you could do a lot of things. You could do a five gallon bucket. You could do a one gallon jug. We could ferment in these plastic containers if we wanted to. What we have today is what we usually use, which is a, this is a three gallon carboy, glass carboy. Uh, these come in plastic and other forms too. Uh, but any kind of a vessel that you can basically seal it off from the outside air is gonna be a good vessel for fermentation. Okay, so, uh, uh, and we gotta clean these, right? You gotta yep. clean them? Yep. Thoroughly, why, yep. why do you have to clean them? Well, there is bacteria, and uh, that would be kind of the nemesis of our, our good cider at the end. So we want to kind of rid all the bacteria from the, from the vessel, uh, give it a basic cleaning and sanitizing, and uh, once we've done that, we can have confidence that the process will uh, go without a hitch. Okay, cool, cool. So uh, what do you use to clean it, Colin? Well, we, we do uh, something called, we use, we, use p potassium metabisulfite, but uh, any homebrew store will have, you know, many, many products. Uh, you can talk to them and they'll give you all kinds of information, probably more than you'll want, about which, which products to use. I mean, for starting, if I rinsed it really thoroughly, could I use like a dish soap to clean it up? Sure, sure, you could, yeah. You got to make sure you rinse it, okay. but you could. Because you don't want a soapy cider, right? Right, right. Yeah. That would be good. All right, well then, how about we uh, put that juice in the jug, okay? Sounds like fun. Let's, Here we go. Uh, let's do that. Here goes. This uh, might take a couple of minutes, uh, but we'll. Uh, so we got the juice. How much juice are we gonna put in this jug, Colin? Uh, it looks like you have uh, six different half gallons. That would be three gallons. And uh, given this is a three-gallon carboy, it should be just about right. 
Oh, well, I guess I did my, my math right then at the store. Uh, okay, so are we going to fill it all the way to the top? Well, we want to be careful of that uh, because the fermentation is going to create some foam and action on the top of the juice. And so we want a little bit of room on the top so it doesn't start fermenting out of the vessel. Okay, so we leave a little space on top. So we'll probably right. leave, uh, we'll probably fill it to somewhere right around there. Uh, yeah, in fact, my very first <coughs> uh, fermentation was Mott's from the grocery store. Oh, how'd that turn out? And uh, it was good enough that I thought, I can do this. That's, that's exactly why we're doing this today. All right, and so, so I don't want to fill all the way, so I'm probably going to do about half of this and maybe go up to the uh, line here. Like that much? Maybe... We'll call it there just to be safe. <clears throat> we want to leave that room for a little bit of fermentation on top. Okay, fantastic. Now, uh, what next? So, <clears throat> next we're going to, uh, very simply, in a basic form, we're going to pitch some yeast. And right here we have uh, some basic wine yeast. And uh, as I look at the label on this, it says, famous for bringing out fresh fruit flavor and for emphasizing the perception of acidity. Oh, that sounds and good. That sounds like that's going to be a winning cider to me. <laughs> so let's do it. Uh, first thing we're going to do now, we'll do another broadcast another time about yeast because it's a pretty in-depth topic. But for today, just the basics. And in a very simple way, uh, we could take this yeast. This is a dry yeast. Yeast also comes in liquid form too. And we could sprinkle some of this into here. We'll probably do about three or four grams which is going to be about half of this packet I have, uh, just for about three gallons of cider. Now, what kind of yeast are you using specifically? Uh, this is a wine yeast. Okay. Um, there are cider yeasts out there. Uh, we like wine yeast, as you know. Uh, we like um, sweet meat yeast on some occasions, just for a little twist. And where uh, can, uh, use where can folks get a wine yeast? So any, any basic homebrew store will have them, and uh, people there are in many cases more knowledgeable than we are and uh, we'll be able to direct you in the right in the right way is this yeast expensive if you buy it at the store no not at all a couple bucks and you're on your way so i'm just going to pour this in and uh there would be things that we could add to this to make it a little bit more of a process we could add a yeast nutrient that'll get this yeast uh starting on its fermentation uh properly and healthily uh, but we're going to go just the basics this is probably going to work just fine and if it doesn't, we can do some things later. And some of these yeasts have instructions on the packet, right? Yeah. So people, if they get a yeast, a wine yeast, uh, or a cider yeast, they can just follow the instructions on the packet. Some of them call for just pouring the yeast on top, right? Exactly. Sometimes you, uh, in most cases, we would hydrate this if we were doing it in a production facility. What, what does that mean? Uh, hydrating means you put this into some warm water, you add some yeast nutrient, you basically are propping that yeast up to be off to a healthy start and uh, heading to your cider with a vigorous ferment. Um, this will be fine because we've used this before in this way. But okay, this now we're going to put basics. something in the top. We're going to close this thing. Yeah, now we want to seal it off. So I'll let you go ahead and do that. You can talk about the airlock. I see so that there's some water in there. Maybe you can explain why that why that's uh, designed that way. Yeah, so we got this this airlock uh, and. There, there are more rudimentary ways to create an airlock. This is the kind you can buy for very cheap from your brew supply store or your mail order brew supply. But this is a bung that goes in the top here that keeps the air out. It's got a little hole in the middle and we can put one of these in there. There are several different variations of the design of this, but this is intended to keep the outside air from coming into the tank but allowing the gases that are created by the fermentation process to escape the tank. And uh, you'll note, that once this gets started fermenting, it'll start to bubble and froth, and that's carbon dioxide. And that, we want that carbon dioxide to escape so the bottle doesn't explode. <laughs> and the, the reason this has the liquid on there so that air cannot get back in, that would be because of the oxygen, is that right? You don't yeah. want oxygen touching your cider. That's actually going to help any bacteria or any maybe bad stuff that's in there uh, from actually uh, making a nice clean fermentation. 
So okay. we want to keep the oxygen from our air out, and we want to keep just the byproduct of that fermentation in, and it can s escape through the airlock only. Okay, so that looks pretty cool right now. Uh, what's going to happen next? So now it's just a waiting period. Uh, the yeast has been pitched, the cider's there. Uh, we just are going to set that aside in maybe a dark corner, cold corner somewhere. Uh, you know, somewhere usually between 50 and 80 degrees is probably adequate, uh, depending on what yeast we use. But, uh, you know, room temp is just going to be fine. So we'll kind of set this aside and uh, we'll probably see some fermentation starting in within a day, is my guess. Cool, cool. Uh, we have something we wanted to show you. Uh, as you know, we've pitched our yeast in our initial juice. And uh, at this point, we wanted to show you a different batch that we have going. Uh, this is a blend of different apples that we've uh, acquired and uh, pressed and have now been fermenting for about seven days or so. Uh, if you can kind of see here, we have uh, some foam on the top. You can see the liquid level is right about here. Uh, and that's why we wanted to be careful with not filling the carboy too high because that foam will actually extend beyond and sometimes actually come right out of the airlock. So we get just about gauged it pretty close here. We get, went a little bit high as you can see uh, some of the fermentation residue is all the way up to the, to the airlock here. Uh, so that's the reason why you want to do that. Uh, Steve, you want to talk to them about maybe what, what they're seeing here uh, and how you know it's fermenting? Yeah, this is really exciting. This is my, one of my favorite parts, our little science experiment. So if you look closely at this container, the yeast is really active. It's eating all the sugar up and what it's giving off is alcohol and carbon dioxide. And as I told you, we needed that airlock so that the carbon dioxide could escape. And you can see up here at the airlock, it's bubbling. That means that the yeast is generating a lot of carbon dioxide and it's escaping through our airlock. So that's working just the way it was planned. And uh, when it does this initial fermentation, this for the first two weeks maybe, you get all this bubbling and frothing. And as Colin said, it creates this residue that kind of builds up and in this case it actually went over the airlock so we had to at some point this past week we had to clean this out because we uh, misgaged the level of, uh, of our fill so this is going to be done fermenting at room temperature in probably in a week or so and it'll look quite a bit different this bubbling will calm down and and all of this haze that you see in here which tells you it's a very active ferment, will start to diminish and it'll start to clarify a bit. So, and you could try this. You can taste this if you want, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. With that, uh, you could pull a sample out and, and, and try it. And, and it's probably a good exercise because, you know, once you, once you start tasting the cider during the ferment, you kind of, over time, get an idea of where it's going. So, all right. So, uh, we're back here with, uh, now we've got a new jug of cider. Uh, and how long ago did we start fermenting this one, Colin? This one is, uh, it's about three weeks, maybe even closer to a month. Uh, so it's gone through the process for the most part. And uh, I'll have you talk about how you know that's right. Yeah, so one thing you can see is that this, this airlock is not very active anymore. There is still a little bit of activity going on here, but only very once in a while do you see the airlock bubbling. So it's it, probably the sugar fermentation has all, all been done. And to the extent there was uh, some cloudiness in this before, it's all gone. You can see there's a, there's a rim around the top where it frothed up during that fermentation we just showed you. Now that is all subsided. And in this one, the cloudiness that was present there has dropped out, actually, very nicely. That doesn't always happen, um, but you know, when you have virtually no activity anymore after you've had a vigorous ferment, then you know it's pretty much done, right? Yeah, so we know that basically the yeast has done its job and turned all the sugar that was in that cider uh, into alcohol. So given that there's just not much action going on here, we know that that process is basically done. Uh, so our next step is we want to be thinking about taking this beautiful, clean, finished ferment cider uh, out of this vessel and into a, another clean vessel, which we have right in front there, um, and leaving some of this gunk behind. Basically this uh, yeast cake on the bottom, 
and some of this residue on the sides. Uh, over time, we don't want that uh, to be kind of introducing any off flavors or aromas to our cider. So we want to be pulling this beautiful clean juice uh, or cider uh, off the lees or the sediment in the bottom uh, into a nice clean carboy. So technically I could drink this again, right? It's ready. This is probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of between 5 and 7% alcohol and it's basically a finished cider uh, and it would be delicious. Very exciting. All right, let's uh, get that started. So we have, um, well, I'll let you talk about the equipment here, Steve. All right, so uh, what, we, what we have here is a siphoning device. And uh, we, we bought this one through a homebrew supply store. You can mail order these. This one I think is called the auto siphon. But hey, you don't have to have something this fancy. I, I remember way back in the day when Colin and I were beer makers together, I, I remember watching Colin use the old school siphon method. And if you, does anybody know what that is? If you know what that is, <laughs> that involves just taking a hose and sucking from one end <laughs> until you've got the beer yeah. flowing and then you stick it right into the, uh, it's a little messy and maybe not quite as sanitary, but the point is, is you don't need one of these tools to siphon from one vessel to another, but you do need a hose and uh, and you do need to siphon. So we want to get it, the, ci the cider off its lees, we call it. And this process, we're, we call it racking. So Colin, why don't you go ahead? Let's, let's do some racking. All right, so what this is, it has uh, basically two, an insert in the middle. It has a rubber gasket here uh, that'll seal uh, between the tubes. And so I know that there's an air uh, lock there. And what I'm going to do is uh, very simply insert the tube into the cider. And you can go all the way to the bottom, but I usually like to pull from the middle because that's the nice clean juice. And I'm just going to very simply pump and you can see it start to come up my tube. At some point it'll go down into gravity fill the other vessel. And you need to have one of these higher than the other because the siphoning process uses gravity. So uh, that's, that's basically uh, uh, how it works, is uh, the, the vacuum created from the cider flowing uh, downward sucks the, cider, the rest of the cider out of this container. How's it going? And as long as it's, yeah, it looks like it's flowing. lower, then I yeah. should have a flow down, downhill there. And I'm just going to tilt my carboy here just to collect the juice in the edge. And I'll try to get as much of this out as I can. Um, try not to pull too much of the sediment with it, keeping the juice nice and clean. All right, just near the end and pulling in a little bit of the cloudiness as I try to get the last bits of that juice. And looks like we're all set. Just so we don't get a mess there, we'll pull that out. So as you can see, I got mostly the clean cider. Uh, I got a little bit of the sediment at the end, so this is looking a little bit cloudy at the moment. Uh, but over time, that will gravity will take it take hold, and uh, those uh, particles will again settle down to the bottom of that car carboy. Uh, this process can be done a couple times uh, if you want to keep racking it off the yeast cake on the bottom. You can do that, uh, but probably not necessary. Once is usually enough, and some people don't even do once. You could. Literally take that cider, as Steve said, that was finished and uh, drink it right out of the, the carboy. So here we are, uh, next step in the process. We have our uh, wonderful, beautiful finished hard cider. And as you can see, it, uh, fermentation, all the evidence points to the fermentation being done. Uh, we have uh, no foam on the top. I'm not seeing any action going on in the juice. I see a very small layer of uh, some yeast in the bottom there. Uh, so things are settling. It's still a little bit hazy, so I think Steve and I will probably hang on to this for a few weeks and let that gravity sort of settle down the particles and, and yeast and all the stuff floating in there. Uh, so we'll have this beautiful clear cider. Uh, but right now the cider is uh, dry, and that simply is a measure of the sugar amount in there. In other words, the yeast has basically uh, eaten up all the sugar. And it's also still, meaning there's no carbonation, uh, but it's very drinkable and uh, probably very delicious is my guess. So um, as far as what to do with this before drinking it, uh, there's a lot of things you can do with it. We'll, we'll talk about that in our future videos, but 
Uh, after it clarifies and we're ready to drink it, uh, we will put it, you can put it in a keg, which is what we typically do uh, because we're a commercial operation and a lot of home cider makers use kegs as well. So that's one thing you can put it in. You can put it into bottles and we're going to use that same siphoning process that we told you about to put it into bottles or you could put it in cans even if you, if you have the equipment to do that. And at that time, or about that time, you can make a decision as to whether you want to sweeten it. Uh, Colin uh, reserved some of the apple juice that we had started with, and that could be used to back sweeten it before you drink it. Or you could use sugar, or there's, there's myriad other things. And uh, we'll get into that in future videos. So uh, until then, cheers, goodbye. Goodbye.